Welcome. You're listening to Mystic Moon Cafe Radio. All right. And, uh, hi there. I'm Wendy. I've got Jacob co-hosting with me tonight. And uh, we will be interviewing the the uh, ever-famous Nick Redfern, ever-popular, and, um, and Jake's... Uh, uh, hero man so <laughs> i'm a big fan yeah <laughs> <laughs> will you be okay for the show jake you know i've got some nerves i do i will admit to that um i've i've got an extensive library with books on ufos and cryptids and nick redfern's names on a lot of them so uh yeah just a little bit of nerves it's <laughs> not you know i i'll try to zen out here it's okay. I don't think he minds, and and it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, we can get right to it since I mean it's a little. Uh, well, I don't think I need to read the entire introduction, but uh, we are excited to welcome back Nick Redfern on Mystic Moon Cafe. Um, we're going to be discussing the newest book, uh, newer book, uh, Cover Ups and Secrets: The Complete Guide to Cover- Government Conspiracies, Manipulations, and Deceptions. We'll also talk about various cryptids and blah, whatever else comes along. So uh, I guess without further ado, if Nick's ready, he's more than welcome to come on. Hey guys. Hello. Hi, Nick. Hey. Clap, 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 clap. There you go. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) So, Nick, um, I got to ask this because this this is about your journey. Uh, How does a lad from Pelsall, England, become the leading ufologist and cryptozoologist, not only in the UK, the US, but really the world? Um. Well, I, know, I guess I don't really think about it like that. I'm just, I kind of just think me as, I'm Nick, you know. <laughs> 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 but, um, but, well, how I got interested was when I was about um, five or six, my mum and dad took me on a week's vacation to Scotland and we spent a day at Loch Ness. And my dad told me the story of the Loch Ness monster. And, um, and even sort of the age of six, I can still... I've got like a few vague memories of standing on the store as my dad told me the story. And, uh, you know, when you're kind of six years old and you, your dad tells you, you know, you're standing on the edge of the shore of this huge lake where, you know, where there's monsters living or strange creatures, it sort of really caught my attention and excitement. And um, when I got to about... Um, 10 or thereabouts i started sort of reading you know monster books for kids that kind of thing and um and so that, that's sort of what got me interested but how i got um into writing was sort of like a a different story um as i said I, you know when i when i was about sort of 10 11 i started reading books on um on the subjects of like ufos and bigfoot and lake monsters that kind of thing but um, as far as the the writing's concerned, well, at school I wasn't I wasn't really the best um, student, <laughs> to, to put it uh, <laughs> bluntly. Uh, I, I just wasn't, you know. I, I just, you know, it's, it's, geography, history, you know, science. I just didn't care, and none of my other friends at school cared. And we just, you know, school was just like somewhere for all us to hang out and you know and uh, have a good time when we could um and as i said i just wasn't really that good at school i didn't i didn't go to uh, college i didn't go to university i just i was kind of like you know the classic sort of (laughs) dropout almost really and um and i actually just pure um luck if you like but but, uh, the town i was living in at the time this was when i was about 17 18 um, they were advertising for somebody straight out of school who they would teach to work on a local magazine it was sort of like a what's on magazine it was called zero and even though i had no background you know i i always enjoyed you know writing uh excuse me i mean reading books you know and articles um and I think when I was about 15 or 16, I, I tried writing, you know, a couple of articles and things here and there. But I'm sure they were terrible now, you know. <laughs> and, and, um, so, and I did that for a couple of years, and that um, dried up. And um, Britain at the time was going through, like, a real kind of recession in terms of the economy. And so, you know, that, that um, job fell through. 
and then for about the next two or three years, um, no, I'm sorry, more than that, about four or five years, I did various jo- <coughs> various jobs. I was a van driver, a forklift driver, a bunch of other things, and um, I did that for about four or five years, and then I thought, well, you know, I can I can keep sort of moving, you know, crates on the forklift till I'm like 65, and then you know, retire and after and 10 years later, die, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know and I didn't really want right. to live like a solid education kind of approach to it, but, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of read the, and studied the structure of how other people wrote books and things like that, and, um, and I thought, well, why don't I have a go at writing a book, and if it doesn't take off, you know, um, I'll just stay you know, driving the forklift or the vans or whatever. Uh Um, And I'd got sort of enough money in the bank saved up to last about six months. And I thought, if I'm not making it six months, you know, it's either Mm -hmm. another job or, you know, it's like you're in the gutter kind of thing. (laughs) And um, and, and funnily enough, what happened was that I put together a a synopsis from a book on UFOs in the UK about what the British government knew about the subject. And I had it sent out to various publishers, one of them being the the UK uh, edition of um, Simon & Schuster. And I got a call one of the days and um, saying, yep, we like the book and, you know, we'd we'd like to take you on. And they actually took me on for a three-book deal. And this was when when I was sort of in my... um, I think it was about 23, 24, 25 Mm -hmm. at the time. And, And that's really how it all took off it really was kind of like just you know various kind of um coincidental things being in the right place at the right time and um and and things just happened you know and um but that's that's kind of how sort of my life's always been really you know it's um you know, when you're a writer, it's it's not what people think. You know, where it's um, mm. it's all like sort of living in the you know Beverly Hills and driving <laughs> Ferraris. <laughs> it's not like you know, it, it can be quite a precarious mm. job. You know, it's like like any self-employed job. But you know, I, I enjoy what I do, and um, and as long as I enjoy it, as long as I you know have that enthusiasm to do it, you know, um, I'll keep doing it. So. And doing it well, doing it very well. Yeah. Oh, well thank- For sure, <laughs> you are prolific, Nick. Prolific writer. Well, it's one of these things where you know there's a lot of different things I'm interested in, but when it comes to writing, you know, it's one. Of, it's like again going back to saying, you know, like um, a self-employed job. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want people to think what I do that I consider it just a job. You know, I don't. If I didn't have the passion and the excitement and the fun for it, you know, I wouldn't do it, you know. Um, so that's why I said, you know, as, as long as I've got that passion for it, I'll I'll keep on doing it. And, uh, you know, I don't see that going away anytime soon, really. Um, but, you know, when it, when it comes to, um, you know, when you said about being prolific, I mean, it's one of these things where there's a lot of things, you know, I like to write about different topics, but um, you also have to be sort of, you know, driven, and also, um, for me at least, you know, you need to be in the right position to be able to write, and by that I mean, you know, I like to sort of work nine to five, Monday to Friday, Um, you know, I sort of get up, have breakfast, and then mess around on Facebook or something, you know, and then, um, you know, post a picture of a talking dog or whatever, and um, (laughs) and then... (laughs) Dog man, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and then sort of like nine to five, Monday to Friday, is when I write the books and the articles. And um, you know, I, I come around uh, five o'clock comes round. You know, I stop. Uh, laptop goes in sleep mode, and then I don't touch it till like nine o'clock the next morning. And on Fridays, I usually finish about four, and I don't touch the laptop again till nine o'clock Monday morning. You know, for me, evenings and weekends are for. You know, having a good time, and um, and you know, I think it's important. You know, to like you know, like in any situation, you know, you you want um, time away and be able to just 
you know, sort of chill out and have a good time, and um, and then you go back to it, you know, on Monday, and um, that way you don't get sort of burned out, um, and you know, you still stay um, enthusiastic about it all. So that's that's you know what I've always done is to sort of um, balance, you know, what I do in terms of the writing um, versus you know your your, your life, so to speak. Very good, and it, and yeah, uh, you don't really have a job though because you love what you're doing. So it's never a a day at work. It's it's I get to go do my passion and have fun with it, and that'll keep you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I think I mean sometimes you know circumstances happen where you know like I said uh, like with me you know I had to, for a few years I was you know forklift driver van driver and you just mm-hmm. you, you know, sometimes it comes to where you just have to do what you have to do to survive but i mean if you can do something that you re- really enjoy you know that's that does make it much better and much easier you know and um and i think it's just a matter of you know sort of tell people you know whether it's writing or if you you know you want to be in a band or you want to do this you want to do that anybody can really do something you know if they've got a dream you can do it but you just really have to get down and do it, you know, um, and and just keep pushing and opening doors. And, um, mm-hmm. and like I said, you have to be very driven, you know, to sort of survive and do something that you, you want to do. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's no good being a mindset of, oh, you know, I'll never do it. You know, that kind of negativity angle is never going to help anyone you know you've got to like i said you've got to be sort of driven and um but not driven to where you know like i said you you that's all your life is you know that that's why i like to sort of as i said take evenings off weekends off and um because you need that time away you know you need a normal or, or as close as normal you know life away from things and and you know to sort of allow you to um you know, sort of just take the time off and um, mm-hmm. and get sort of, you know, fired up for the, the next day or whatever. Right, right. Go talk to your muse for a little while elsewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, um, now, you recently had a book come out, um, Flying Saucers and the Kremlin, and we were wondering, um, what are the commonalities between Russian, American, and British UFO anomalies and cover-ups? <laughs> Well, that book, um, Flying Saucers from the Kremlin, that book literally just ca- came out um, last week. It's only been out about um, five days and um, mm-hmm. six days. And that's, that book's like a study, not so much of UFOs directly, but how at the height of the Cold War, the, the Russians tried their, their best, and, and fortunately they failed. Um, the, mm-hmm. the idea was to sort of try and create hysteria in the U.S. by um, sort of seeding um, fake UFO stories um, in the hope that it would sort of cause panic and hysteria. Now, as we know, you know, it it didn't really work that well. People just, it was actually the opposite, you know, people got fascinated by the subject. (laughs) But the the Russians did have these weird plans to try and, you know, create, terror um by fabricating ufo stories and then feeding them in the united states and the uk um but i think you know when you look at the the issue of how the real ufo phenomenon is kind of um addressed by governments i think it's pretty much the same all around the world you know i mean i don't think there's any sort of um you know civilized country which hasn't at some point, you know, um, open a UFO program of one sort or another to try and understand, you know, what's flying in their airspace. And I think, I think a lot of the secrecy, again, in many countries, I think the reason for the secrecy isn't necessarily all because of what they know and they don't want to tell us, but it may actually be what they don't know, you know, and they don't want to admit they're completely ignorant about what's going on in the skies above. And for a lot of people, you know, we we kind of 
many people sort of look at governments, you know, to sort of look after us, etc. But, you know, if the truth was the other way around, that, <coughs> excuse me, that governments actually don't have the answers when we think the government does know, you know, for a lot of people that might be more scary if the, you know, if the government admitted, well, we haven't got a clue what these things are, what they want, where they come from, what their agenda is, all we know is that we're not able to do anything about it. That might actually, for a lot of people, be more sort of scary than actually being told, you know, what the truth is. Very possibly, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, Nick, in, in this regard, w when you were researching this book and writing about flying saucers in the Kremlin, what really stood out or surprised you as you were learning about about the Russians and their, I guess, hyster hysteria or misinformation campaign? Well, yeah, I mean, th this was like a really weird aspect of the UFO subject. Um, you know, the, the Russians were investigating UFO cases like we were uh, and still are, but they were also creating totally fabricated stories as a means to try, <coughs> excuse me, as a means to try and sort of destabilize the other side now i mean we were doing this as well for example i mean a number of documents have surfaced um which make it clear that at least some stories of crashed ufos um were fabricated by u.s intelligence as a means to freak the russians out and have them believe that we got our hands on alien technology now it's entirely possible that we do have our hands on alien technology but some of these stories were created um as a means to scare the russians into thinking we've got you know some sort of extraterrestrial doomsday weapon that could you know um take the russians off the map you know so um but that's how very often you know the, the world of counterintelligence as it's known and um psychological warfare where you know fabricated stories are, are created to try and steer the enemy into a different direction or to have them you know looking for things that aren't actually there or just trying to d even destabilize you know the population of the of the country that's being targeted and um you know then a lot of the people who do this kind of psychological warfare they're sort of very skilled into finding ways to mislead the enemy and um and in, certainly in the late 40s onwards through the um 50s onwards even more um there were all sorts of bizarre programs um for example um back in the 1950s whereas today you know we have the abductees the alien abductees well back in the 50s you had the contactees people who claimed um contact with very human looking aliens people like um george adamski george van tassel um truman bethram orfeo angelucci they're some of the more famous um contactees of the 1950s and they claimed that they'd been visited by these very human looking aliens who wanted us to sort of lay down our nuclear weapons and you know live alongside each other um but what's particularly intriguing is that a number of the contactees were approached by what you could almost call like men in black type characters who tried to get the contactees in the US on board um, to to tell the world that the aliens they were meeting were communists. Now that sounds bizarre <laughs> and almost laughable, you know, and almost almost laughable today. But they the the uh, the Russians actually and at lectures and conferences to say how not only are the aliens communists but communism is wonderful you know that that's what <laughs> the russians were trying to do and in some cases it actually worked they did succeed in sort of um recruiting some of these contactees who actually did go out there and say yes you know the russia russia the russian way of life is great communism is great oh and by mm. the way the aliens are communists as well and, <laughs> um so it's like really strange games were played you know back then as a means to um 
you know, just just sort of play with the other side and just, um, you know, kind of find more and more of ways to um, to destabilize destabilize the enemy, if you like. Yeah, that seems to parallel with. Um in 2016, the Russian agents were recruiting a bunch of Americans through social media for their events, and that just seems like it's a pretty common Russian slash Soviet uh, thing to do. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. another example, which I talk about in the book just to demonstrate some of the weirder um, examples, is that this one has nothing to do with UFOs, but back in the late 1940s through the early 50s, the Russians started spreading rumors in the U.S. that um, they'd been able to smuggle four or five atomic bombs into the U.S. and that they were situated in five different cities around the, UK, around the U.S., like New, uh, New York, Los Angeles, and so on. And the FBI opened um, a file on this, and it basically, as you would understand, it freaked them out. You know, the idea that the Russians may have smuggled five atomic weapons into the U.S., and, you know, they were primed and ready to go. And we had no idea as to which cities the bombs were in. You could easily understand how the FBI, you know, were in a state of, of fear, basically. You know, when are these bombs going to go off? How, how can we find out where they are? And it turned out it was absolutely not true. You know, the Russians never mm. managed to smuggle any um, atomic weapons, atomic bombs into the U.S. And, of course, as we know, thankfully, um, none of them were any de detonated. But, again, this was a very uh, sort of sophisticated plan to try and convince the U.S. government um, that, you know, they had got these bo uh, bombs smuggled into the U.S. And it was such a like a worry to the government that the files, uh, the FBI's files, because it was the FBI who tried to find out, you know, who was doing this and, you know, can we stop it before there's like a, you know, Armageddon or whatever. Um, but the the FBI, the files on this uh, particular program, if you like, um, were not released until about five or six years ago because um, there was still that kind of concern as to, you know, what would the public think if, um, you know, the, there was this, this uh, project going on where the Russians, you know, were creating hysteria within the government. And, um, and so they sat on it for, for decades and the, the files were, as I said, um, released only a few years ago. Wow. Now, have, uh, has the current um, alien in charge, I won't go too much there, um, has, <laughs> has he made it difficult? Has, has he eradicated the Freedom of Information Act yet? <laughs> <laughs> not yet <laughs> not yet okay I, I hadn't seen it but that doesn't mean i just didn't miss one of the many atrocities going on good point yeah. well i mean the, the one thing about the, the uh, freedom information act you know if you go the right way around it um you know you can still get good material and the the fbi have a really good website called the vault and if you just google fbi vault You'll find their website, and they've they've posted literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages of previously classified documents. Um, in terms of the paranormal, they've posted all their uh, cattle mutilation files, their UFO files, um, files on it on how they try to train um, agents to use ESP and psychic phenomena to spy on the enemy, things like wow. that. So there's a lot of interesting material and they actually even, believe it or not, last week, excuse me, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. the FBI um, uploaded to the vault um, its files on Bigfoot. <laughs> and um, oh, and we'll, talk got, about, we'll talk about yeah. that a little bit later. <laughs> They've actually got a few files on, on Bigfoot, believe it or not. And um, so, you know, the FBI have been really good to release their files, but it's, it's always the case, you know, that sometimes material which is deemed as, you know, still being covered by national security issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's still the case that many files, you know, are, are withheld for a long, long time. And there actually are, you know, clauses that allow for, you know, files to be withheld for, for decades in some cases. And, um, and also there's some cases where 
conveniently, you know, files have gone missing when, you know, they cannot be found when they mm. when they should be found. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a good side to it, but there's also, you know, the the more frustrating side where, you know, it has proved to be difficult sometimes, you know, to get material. So. Oh, sure, mm-hmm. sure. Now, um, does that, any of that tie in with, um, say, the uh, MK Ultra or Project Blue Book pro- uh, the projects <laughs> um, from the CIA and the FBI? I believe those were, weren't they? Well, yeah, I mean, the MK Ultra was, um, in simple terms, it was the, the, the government's mind control program. Mm-hmm. The MK Ultra was designed oh. to basically. Um, you know, sort of uh, how to hypnotize people, um, create what would become known as like Manchurian candidates, like um, programmed assassins, you know, okay. sort of, in other words, like uh, manipulating the human mind, the brain. And they did a lot of research using things like LSD and psychedelics. And it was also done to try and determine, you know, if they captured any Russian spies, you know, they could sort of dose them with drugs and, you know, get information from them, like truth drugs. Now, what's particularly interesting, which goes back a little bit to the Freedom of Information Act, is that in the up until the mid-1970s, even within government, hardly anybody knew about MK Ultra then, and the whole program was sort of steeped in secrecy. Um, and when in the 70, uh, early to mid-70s that the U.S. media started to hear of this program, um, it got to the point where, you know, they were digging further and further, and the CIA got very worried. And the, um, the CIA... Excuse me, the CIA director at the time, uh, Richard Helm, uh, he actually ordered the MK Ultra files to be burned because, and shredded. Oh, wow. The reason being that they felt they'd done all the research and so the original files weren't really needed anymore because they knew exactly what they needed to do. And quite literally what happened was that Helms, uh, Richard Helms ordered one of his staff to go to one of the archive places where all the MK Ultra, MK Ultra material was held, and quite literally to destroy it all. Now, fortunately, it wasn't all destroyed, but you know, sort of seventy, eighty percent of it was, and we'll never really know what was contained in mm. those files. So sometimes, you know, files don't get um, withheld not just for national security uh, reasons, sometimes they're withheld because they have been destroyed, you know. It's like the ultimate way of withholding, is you destroy them. <laughs> yes, it is, very much so. <laughs> that, I, that also kind of went back to the men who stare at goats, doesn't it? Didn't they do a lot of the ESP and, and that type of mm-hmm. uh, yeah. research? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they did... Um, I mean, over the years, the uh, various government agencies all around the world have done all sorts of weird programs. You know, we just think about UFOs and things like remote viewing, as it became known, like, um, you know, the powers of the mind. But um, about 10 years ago, um, the U.S. Army released a file from the 1950s when they were trying uh, trying to use... Um, dogs to psychically find landmines on battlefields and um, and it didn't work, you know, the dogs just happily ran around the area the, the test area and um, <laughs> and you know, they gave up on the program, it turned out the dogs couldn't psychically find landmines, you know <laughs> right. and um, yeah, and uh, but there's all sorts of, you know, other pro- really weird programs, for example the, you, I swear I'm not lying when I say this, but in the Second World War, they they had a, the U.S. military had a plan to um, have sort of not aircraft with planes, excuse me, with pilots on board, but to have sort of guided uh, missile type aircraft, and they would actually have like a pigeon inside the cockpit, and the plan was to try and teach the pigeons to press specific buttons to, um, like, drop a bomb at a certain time. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and um, you know, you can see, imagine just like this you know, little pigeon, you know, in the cockpit and um, has to sort of, you know, peck with his beak on one of the buttons and then the <laughs> bomb bay opens and the bombs drop. But, I mean, again, it's no surprise that it didn't really work at all. But, um, you know, a lot of strange uh, programs like this were put together 
mm-hmm. over the years, and uh, unfortunately, uh, no animals were killed in the process. So they were <laughs> okay. <laughs> they that's the very program, good. The programs yeah. just didn't even take off at all, really. Okay. So, but it does demonstrate, you know, some of the wacky operations that are put together, as well as the the more down to earth ones. Right. Now, um, in in the cover-ups book, uh, you you went into the CIA and the, the Martian, uh, I'm going to call it spying, but I, a remote viewing, I guess, maybe with the uh, psychics. Oh, yeah. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about what they did? And Oh, yeah, this is a really interesting um, story. Um, uh, if, for people listening who haven't heard of remote viewing, it's basically sort of using the power of the mind to focus on other locations. And this was done, you know, sort of very well in the um, at the height of the Cold War through the 70s and the 80s. And basically, um, you know, like, for, say, for example, the CIA want to try and focus on what's going on in the Kremlin right now. They would use psychic people with psychic skills who would literally almost sort of like astrally travel their soul to the wow. to the uh, Kremlin and see what was being spoken about and then you know they would sort of return to their body and then you know it would be a case of essentially um, then getting all the information from the remote viewer so it's sort of like psychically spying mm. now the program began in the early 70s and went on for a couple of decades and there's still rumors that you know it's still being done now but one of the more intriguing um, efforts that went ahead was in 1984 when for reasons which we don't really understand and that in itself is important um, for reasons we don't know somebody in the CIA wanted um, the remote viewing team to remote view the planet Mars but they wanted the remote viewers involved to try and focus on how Mars looked round about a million years ago. And again, the important thing, or one of the important things is what prompted the CIA to do that? And we, we still don't have that answer. Now, that kind of suggests that somebody or a group within the CIA has some knowledge of activity on Mars or life on Mars in the distant past and they were trying to use the remote viewers to sort of in essence you know project their mind back in time like a million years or so which was the the figure they were looking for and according to the remote viewers um that that were used in this particular uh, project they said that they could see Mars as sort of like a like a rapidly dying planet it was almost you know as if it was um you know just sort of rolling towards destruction that the the atmosphere was degrading um the you know earthquakes and volcanoes and um you know there was sort of death on a massive scale and um you know, it, it was like as if Mars was on its final legs, um, whether it was caused by, you know, something like um, global warming. Uh, oh, sorry, that doesn't exist, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it does we, us. Uh, <laughs> we do have that question coming up later. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but basically, um, you imagine sort of the, your worst nightmare in like a, a sci-fi movie, you know, when if the Earth sort of, you know, on its final legs and the atmosphere is falling, falling apart and so on. That was the image that the remote viewers picked up um, when they were remote viewing... Mars, and it, it came across as like a very, um, you know, sort of strange situation, you know, um, with the Martians trying to save themselves and heading underground and, and sort of um, destroyed buildings, you know, and just everywhere and just chaos and disaster. And, um, and they also remote viewed um, sort of later on as well. And this is when the whole um, issue surrounding the so-called face on Mars uh, mm. began, this, this sort of large face-like structure on Mars, which some people think is just, you know, a piece of rock. Other people think it's like a carved face. But um, the CIA looked into that as well. And, and again, they came up with sort of this imagery, um, you know, of a ruined 
decayed planet, um, you know, whose lives were extinguished like, you know, a million years ago, but some of the buildings and, you know, structures were still around. And I guess, you know, the, the closest analogy you could think of is like, um, you know, like the final um, minutes in the, you know, the... the uh, 1968 movie Planet of the Apes, you know, uh, yeah. Charlton Heston sees mm -hmm. that, you know, he thinks he's on an alien world and with all these talking apes, when he stumbles across, like, the ruins of the Statue of Liberty and he realizes he's actually traveled through time, you know, and, uh, and our civilization's gone. And that's what the, the CIA reportedly picked up on Mars, like this once huge civilization, thriving civilization that either destroyed itself in a war or, you know, um, environment collapsed. But um, but as I said, you know, as disturbing as the the results were, you know, the, the big question we don't have the answer to is to this day is why the CIA wanted Mars remote viewed in the first place. That That's, you know, mm -hmm. arguably even more intriguing in itself. Uh, so let's just quick pause here. I have a question for you from our chat room, and it's from Ross. He's from Seattle, Washington, and he's asking, is the UK or America more protective over their belief of alien life forms? Um, well, I think, you know, the, the UK and the US have always sort of been friends and, you know, have also been sort of kind of followed a similar path you know, in terms of a lot of things, really. Mm -hmm. So I think what I've seen, at least, you know, when it comes to government files and, you know, old-timers coming out, you know, and talking about what they knew and what they did, you know, when they're in their 30s and 40s and now when they're in their 80s and 90s, they don't care, you know, what they say. Um, but I think pretty much the approach... Um, and the secrecy in the UK and the US is pretty much the same. I think, you know, there have been, well, not that I think, I know that, you know, there have been some significant UFO events which may have sort of an effect on national security, and both sides, you know, have decided to, to keep this information under wraps, um, partly because they're trying to understand the technology because, you know, if you can understand alien technology, well, you know, that's really going to put you ahead of just about any, anyone else on the planet. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but I think one of the primary goals of, you know, whether it's the UK or the US, isn't necessarily to understand the nature of the, you know, the alien phenomenon or whatever the phenomenon is, but to try and weaponize, you know, the the alien technology, you know, which is, I guess it's kind of predictable that we would try and, you know, weaponize the technology, but that's how yeah. we work, you know, I guess. But I, I do think, you know, in, in relation to Russ's question, I do think that, um, I think it's pretty much similar in both countries and, um, you know, in terms of the uh, wanting the technology to be able to mm -hmm. use the technology, you know, to try and determine is the phenomenon a threat. Um, you know, I think it's the, the kind of similar things that go through the minds of of just about anyone who sort of holds a you know position of power in government. And as I said earlier, I think there's also this issue of wondering if they should tell the public if they're not really sure what's going on, because then it makes us look kind of weak and vulnerable if we don't mm. if we admit we haven't actually got any answers you know mm -hmm. and then uh as a follow-up question to that in your book cover-ups and secrets which came out on june 1st for the fans out there uh with the section on nasa cover-ups i mean we have the the satellites that we put in orbits around different planets they've detected water and the i the basic chemicals that could lead to life. Um, for example, we know Mars had oceans. It's got an ice cap with Europa. We know it's got these geysers of water coming out of it. If they've really just detected these little microbes, the the building blocks of life, why why don't they just go ahead and say that? Have they determined there's actually extraterrestrial life within our solar system, just outside of Mars for a moment? And if it's just bacteria, I mean, what's the big deal? 
Well, I mean, that's a good question. And I think what it may come down to is that it's not just sort of, you know, bacterial life or, you know, some sort of virus, that kind of thing. I think that if, it, if that's all that there was, you know, if, you know, there were just, you know, some little life forms found, you know, sort of like a half-inch worm or something like mm-hmm. that, I don't see any reason not to say that. I mean, you know, saying that you found a a one-inch worm, you know, 20 feet under the surface of Mars. That's not going to make British... I mean, I mean the, the world civilization collapse, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you could be not, good. anyway. <laughs> could be good. <laughs> you know, we would be in big trouble if, you know, we uh, we fell apart over a worm, you know. So, <laughs> um, But, yeah, no I mean, way. joking aside... <laughs> yeah. I mean, joking aside, I don't see any reason as to why something like that should be withheld. The only thing I can really think of is that somebody knows that even if there are sort of little insects or whatever, that that's not the whole story. Mm. And, you know, I think there's a lot of um, potential questions that would come out if, for example, you know, government came forward and said, okay, you know, We've, let's just say, you know, hypothetically, they make a clandestine uh, flight to Mars and find a bunch of material and confirm, you know, that there are ruins of pyramid-type structures, you know, which people have talked about on Mars. Um, that, it wouldn't end there because it, then it would sort of connect to, well, who were they, you know, where are they from? Did they were they all destroyed? You know when their when their atmosphere degraded, or did they manage to escape from Mars? And did they come here? And if they mm-hmm. came here, you know, are we the Martians? You know, did they look mm-hmm. exactly like us on Mars? And they made it here, and we are them, mm-hmm. and they are us. Or you could take the view, you know, did the Martians manage to get to Earth, and were they perceived as being our gods? You know, and when you bring religion into anything, it always causes controversy. So I can easily understand how if evidence of life on Mars was found and it was intelligent life, you know, and there were uh, ruins and remains of structures and things like that, I think there might be a tendency, unfortunately, on the part of government to not tell us because it would open this sort of Pandora's box of, or what does this to do with, have to do with uh, religion? You know, did they come here? Why are there pyramid-type structures on Earth and there seem to be pyramid-type structures on Mars and the face mm. on Mars, uh, Mars kind of looks like the Sphinx in Egypt. So does that mm-hmm. mean there's a connection somehow? And there would be all these issues that would come tumbling out. So I can easily say why someone in government would say, look, it's going to be much easier just not to tell them, you know, and I think that that's probably what's happened, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. Uh, I can almost imagine it being the um, the Atlantans uh, who, you know, they disappeared. Maybe Earth wasn't quite as compatible oh, yeah. with their their technology as, you know, from Mars to here and then, you know, big implosion, and they may have spread some of their technology to, say, the uh, ancient Egyptians and possibly the the Greeks and and the whole nine yards. But uh, I'm going to lean that way. What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, you can go back to pretty much all cultures, you know, where Mm -hmm. they've all got gods and sort of supernatural beings that come down from the sky, you know, Mm and... um, I mean, even things like, you know, in in the Bible, things like, you know, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, if you read that, I mean, you know, this, these cities that were targeted for destruction and, you know, the stories that Lot's wife was turned into this pillar of salt or vaporized. Mm. And, and, you know, the cities were flattened and um, Lot's family were warned to go into caves and hide, you know, um, underground. Uh, you know, that kind of, almost like a warning, you know, to keep, to sort of protect yourself from radiation. And, you know, the yep. the cities were reportedly, you know, were told by these mysterious visitors, Lot's family was told to, you know, to look, uh, to, excuse me, to, um, to leave the cities, but never look back, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. that's kind of like, you know, if, um, if ever we had a, a war today, I mean, a lot of people don't know, you know, if, if you survive the bomb, 
you know, let's say, God forbid it happened, but if we went to, you know, World War Three, mm-hmm. um, you know, let's say the nearest city to you would be vaporised, your millions would be dead in a millisecond, but then you've got to deal with the radiation. Yeah. And um, there's, uh, there's also other things a lot of people don't realise, is that when you have an atomic explosion, um, the flash from the... Um, from the explosion itself if you are in for, unfortunately happen to be looking out your window um you know at the time when the when the bomb explodes um it can cause significant eye damage even permanent blindness and also the the incredible blast of the sound um uh, tests have shown it will just blow your eardrums out you know so there isn't really much to look forward to in that situation you know um but if you look at the parallels between you know things like uh, like i said sodom and gomorrah it almost sounds like localized tactical nuclear strikes you know now of course the big question is was this being done by you know sort of early but very advanced humans or could it even have been you know martians escaped from mars came here and then started turf wars here you know and were perceived as our gods that destroyed the cities or whatever okay uh quick pause here we have a question from our chat room it's from cindy in kansas city and nick in your view what is the situation with the underground space portals located in iraq i didn't know anything about this by the way so i didn't either. this is okay. this will be a good learning um, well, there are a few stories um, along those lines, like um, portals and doorways, the idea of sort of being able to jump from, you know, one area to another in in seconds, but actually traveling, you know, incredible distances. And this sort of um, ties in with things like portals and doorways and um, and things like quantum physics, which allows for sort of like multiple um, dimensional realities, you know, sort of coexisting alongside each other. And um, certainly in the, you know, the early years of, um, you know, the war in Iraq against Saddam Hussein, a lot of strange rumors and stories came out of Iraq um, of supposedly at the height of the, you know, when we're fighting Saddam Hussein, uh, rumors were circulating that sort of advanced technologies had been found in Iraq and um and that some of them reportedly um concerned uh, one of the ancient um iraqi um kings king gilgamesh and um which is a story going back thousands of years and what's interesting about gilgamesh he was like described as being like a, a gi- like a giant type figure who lived to about 130 years so clearly wasn't a normal human so to speak Mm -hmm. so um yeah there's there's a lot of weird stuff uh, but even when for example um the the baghdad museum was looted at the height of the um of the iraqi war and a lot of really um you know important and priceless artifacts went vanished from the museum and these all sort of uh, related to ancient uh, iraqi history and rumors again were flying around that some of this uh some of these items um were deliberately taken to prevent anyone from finding the truth of this sort of ancient astonishing history in iraq so there's a lot of weird stuff um like that uh coming out of iraq that's fantastic yeah um, so, if we could step back to the Martians and and the possible move to the U.S., the question for you, Nick, is with all the DNA testing that the kits that are going on now, we've found like some of those will report you have so much Neanderthal in you. Are we finding any other, uh, let's just say, anomalies in human DNA that can't necessarily be explained and could be linked back to it and alien inhabitation of the earth um i wouldn't say we're finding sort of anomalies that we don't understand but i mean one of the interesting things that is you know this one uh, particular small percentage of the human race whose blood 
is is quite different actually to everybody else and um and it's people who um basically called r h negative r h standing for rhesus and okay basic, basically uh people the number of people um who have uh, who are r h negative um the figure's actually very low um it's about two to anywhere anywhere between about two and six or seven percent of the world's population and basically um it means if you have one particular protein um in your blood um you're rh positive if you don't have it you're rh negative mm -hmm. and but and now for the most part you know it doesn't uh, cause any issues at all but the one issue more than anything else which is a very significant one is that for example um if you have a woman um who is rh negative and let's say, you know, her husband, boyfriend is RH uh, positive um, and, and she gets pregnant. Now, the, uh, there's no compatibility uh, between the blood. And mm -hmm. as bizarre as it sounds, um, the mother's um, immune system quite literally tries to kill the growing embryo. And... Fortunately, that, that doesn't happen in today's world because we have science and medicine to prevent that from actually happening. But before we fully understood the nature of, of blood and how there were different groups and, and the RH negative versus RH positive, unfortunately, you know, um, babies, um, you know, the fetus would die mm -hmm. because the mother perceived the, you know, the RH baby as being essentially dangerous you know to her oh, wow. so but now that's a sort of really strange situation uh where you have um you know someone whose blood is so incompatible that it even tries to you know as i said to, to kill the the fetus um now there's no real understanding as to why a small percentage of the population is RH negative. You know, why aren't we all RH positive? And this, even though we understand the nature of, of the blood, we don't know why there should be this small difference. Mm -hmm. Now, what's intriguing is that a lot of people who um, are RH negative have come forward and have, have talked about having profound alien encounters and particularly abduction experiences and within ufology this has sort of given rise to like an entire subculture almost of people who believe that um you know whether they are rh negative or they mm -hmm. have friends who are and so on but it basically comes down to the idea that could we have been manipulated you know genetically manipulated in the distant past by extraterrestrials and that this sort of um, small percentage of the population could be sort of the offspring, if you like, or the uh, the creation almost um, of um, you know what what might actually be the results of sort of genetic tinkering by mm -hmm. extraterrestrials. So I mean, it's a controversial area. And unfortunately, there have been some people who've written about this subject who have, you know, tried to present it, um, you know, as, as one group being superior over another. And they've actually uh, inserted sort of, they've kind of inserted, like, you know, racist tones yeah. into it. And um, so that's why I always tell people, you know, because I wrote a book up about this called Bloodline of the Gods. And as oh, I yeah. pointed mm -hmm. out, I, what's that? Oh, no, we were agreeing we know the book. <laughs> oh, okay. But um, so I always point out to people, you know, it's important not to play the race card because that actually has nothing to do with it. But there are some people who have used that as an agenda, you know, to, um, to sort of promote, um, you know, sort of racist um, commentary and so on. Mm. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a controversial area. Um, but for me, you know, I don't see, um, you know, that we need to go down that path. I think it, it, all it comes down to is that a small percentage of the human population is slightly different to the others, and many people within that small group have had a lot of profound UFO encounters. And for me, hmm. that's so far, that's, that's where it begins and ends, you know. I think okay. we don't need to get into the, the politics of it all in terms of, you know the the more controversial um, 
statements that certain people have said, and which is really born out of their agendas rather than just mm -hmm. looking at the data, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as they like to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, we've uh, found now that uh, the FBI, I believe it was, does have uh, files on Bigfoot, the Sasquatches. What all do they have and what might they be hiding? Well, so there's several files. Uh, one of them, um, we're still waiting to be released, but it's a really interesting story, and it revolves around something that became known as the Minnesota Iceman. Um, oh, yeah. It basically goes back to the 1960s in Minnesota um, when a man named Frank Hansen put on display in a block of ice this strange-looking creature that looked... didn't look like a Bigfoot. It looked more like sort of a very primitive human but with ape-like characteristics. In other words, it looked like a very primitive early human. Okay. And um, it was in this block of ice... And uh, Frank Hansen put it on display for a number of years, and it was sort of like a carnival display. You know, it'd be um, shown at sort of carnival um, situations around different towns. You know, he's kind of you know he'd pull into town and come and see the the frozen ice man, that kind of thing. Now, what's interesting is that um, two men, uh, Bernard Hovelmans and and a colleague, um, they sort of looked into this and. Um, decided that this was not some sort of like carnival um fabricated latex dummy or anything like that they came to believe that um, this really was some sort of primitive um human or some sort of unknown human-like ape um and that frank hansen had the real deal now the big question is where did it come from one of the theories um is because the theory, or the story was that it was shot and killed in Vietnam at the heights of the Vietnam War in the 60s. And the theory is that U.S. troops actually smuggled it back into the U.S. in a, in a body bag, you know, the body bags that they use for the troops. Mm -hmm. And um, now when, rumors, when that rumor got out, it created another rumor. And that rumor was that the creature in the block of ice might not just have been an ape, that it could have been some sort of early primitive human. And even if it was an early primitive human, in, law, in the terms of the law, it was still a human. And Frank Hansen hmm. got very worried when he heard that the FBI intended to investigate him because they wanted to know if it, re if it, was, if it was a dummy, they couldn't care less. Um, if it was an ape, well, you know, it was nothing to do that the FBI would get involved in anyway. But the FBI was concerned as to the possibility that what was in this block of ice was some sort of human. And Frank Hansen freaked out, and, you know, the idea that, you know, the FBI in hot pursuit of him, uh, you know, chasing him <laughs> down, you know, the mm -hmm. highway with this with this strange hairy figure in the back of his <laughs> van or whatever, you know. I mean, it kind of sounds like something out of Scooby-Doo. You know yeah, I mean? Harry and the Hendersons, yes, definitely. <laughs> Harry and the Hendersons, yeah. But it's yeah. not a real estate but, um, developer behind it all at the end. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's one of those almost sort of too good to be true, except it really was. And mm. so what Hansen did, he actually got a model um, of the um, Iceman made, and the original one, the real one, was reportedly handed over to like a multi-millionaire who, um, who was a friend of Hansen, who basically um, uh, kept it and may still keep it to this day. Now, the, the fake one, you can actually see it. It still exists. It's in the Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas. And mm -hmm. um, so you can go down and see that one. But Frank Hansen, Hansen got rid of the, the real one because he was sort of, you know, worried, um, you know, terrified is probably a better word, when he learned that J. Edgar Hoover, you know, was going to possibly dispatch a couple of agents to, uh, to speak to him. And so... Um, you know, I mean, it's the sort of thing that you could really turn into a, a pretty adventurous, funny movie, you know. Mm -hmm. right. and, um, but what's interesting, we know for sure that the FBI did this investigation and did 
um, you know, go looking for Hansen. But the, the files on the Minnesota Iceman have not been released just yet. Um, oh. But um, there's another case where in the 1970s, um, a Bigfoot researcher approached the FBI to see if their forensics departments could take a look at some um, hairs perceived as being unusual and um, and if they could analyse them to see what they were. And it came up as basically non-Bigfoot. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But it's interesting, you know, that the FBI was willing to, to take a look at, um, you know, at the data. And there have been rumours over the years that um, government agencies have sort of captured or killed Bigfoot creatures and they've got them, you know, sort of on ice, almost like Frank Hansen. But, of course, the big question is, well... You know, why would the government hide the fact that, you know, mm. that they've got a Bigfoot and the Bigfoot exists? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, within conspiracy theories, there's like different, there's different angles. One is the idea that, well, if these creatures are a form of human and not just a giant ape, then should they be given the same rights as us? And if they live in the forest, you know, does that mean that foresters and, you know, can no longer knock trees down or whatever, you know, because that's their territory and they're humans just like us. There's mm -hmm. also the issue, you know, if you were to shoot and kill a Bigfoot, you know, in terms of the law, could you be, you know, sentenced for murder? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that would happen, or at least I don't think it would happen the first time, but if it was then proved that these, these creatures were actually some form of human, you know, I could easily see how uh, after people have been warned and somebody still went ahead and killed one of them, then, well, maybe that person could be brought up for murder, as strange as it might sound. So, you know, there's, there's stories and theories like that as to why, you know, the government might not want to tell us because it would sort of open so many sort of doors of a legal kind, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, so in, in the regard with Bigfoot, I mean, I, there's there's a couple of things that want to discuss a little bit deeper here is one even if they do decide say bigfoot which is definitely a hominid uh if anything it, they couldn't do murder but it, talk about an endangered species you know mm. it, it, so for sure because there i mean we don't even have a we wouldn't even have a count on what it would be so you could possibly shoot the last species or the last of the species. But the other side of it is with the FBI, and I did read the Washington Post article where they released the, the FBI released the analysis, and, and they said it was essentially a deer, in the deer family. Yeah. But why, I mean, they looked into it because they had, there had to be some possibility. I mean, if if there wasn't, they wouldn't have done that. But would it be in their interest to go through all of that analysis just to come up and say, mm. you know, it was a twelve point buck? You know, <laughs> what yeah. what what would why would they wait that long? And we're seeing the papers, their copies. It makes me think there's something going on behind the scenes. And do you have any insight to what would be happening there? Well, yeah, as I said, you know, there are these rumors that would make it kind of really controversial. You know, it's people think, you know, one day if we've just found evidence of Bigfoot, well, we've just found evidence. We know Bigfoot exists. But it would open a lot of other doors. Like I said, you know, what if they are for a, a type of human? You know, what's the law surrounding them? Um, is the territory in which they live, um, should that be... Um, you know, protected because it's their territory in the same way we protect our cities and so on. Um, and But there's also a, another reason why some people have suggested that, you know, the government may know but doesn't want to talk about it because there are a number of cases, not that many, at least on record, but a lot of weird stories where people um, have vanished in areas where these creatures have been seen. Oh, yeah, so true. And there, yeah. there are rumours of, you know, people being killed by these creatures. And, you know, so the idea of, you know, all the people who go missing every year, maybe some of them we now know as to why they've gone missing, and particularly in the woods, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that particular angle 
um, which is which is without doubt the most controversial one. You know, the the theory that um, you know the the the, ish, the sort of the image in Harry and the Hendersons, you know, yeah. with sort of cuddly Bigfoot, yes. maybe sort of very far and wide from the truth of this sort of rampaging ape that it sees us. You know, we're sort of six foot tall and Bigfoot's like eight foot tall and 500 pounds, you know, he might sort of yeah. view you as, as lunch and dinner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, what, I mean, joking aside, that is one of the the interesting theories that, you know, the government knows where at least some of these people who vanished under very odd circumstances in the woods, or they, or if they don't know, they kind of suspect there might be something to this. But the, but the sort of the, the final, the other angle is that the, as bizarre as it sounds, there's been a lot of cases where people have seen Bigfoot-type creatures, and at the same time and location, they've seen UFOs as well. Mm. And there have even been cases of Bigfoot having been seen literally in the direct vicinity of UFOs. And so this has given rise to the idea that, they, yes, there's some sort of large ape, but mm. what if there's some sort of extraterrestrial creature you know, and again, that would then sort of open up the, you know, the UFO issue again. Mm -hmm. So potentially the government has various reasons to play down the whole mm -hmm. Bigfoot angle, you know. Would, yeah, uh, so go ahead, that go ahead, Wendy. Of, haven't the same types of reports been um, re reported for like the dog man as well? Yeah, well, the, the dog man's sort of a you know a, a different thing. It's like um, for, again, for people who don't know, the dog man phenomenon. Uh, it's been around a long, long time, but it's really sort of really taken off in the last fifteen years thereabouts, and mainly through the uh, the writing and research of Linda Godfrey, who's done a lot of really good books on this phenomenon, which has been not completely, but. Um, has been seen regularly in, for example, um, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Ohio, and they're described as like hair-covered creatures walking upright, but it, rather than having an ape-like face like Bigfoot, they've mm -hmm. got like a large muzzle and pointed ears. So inevitably this has given rise to the, the image that they kind of look like werewolves, you know, like a humanoid figure on, that can run on two limbs and four, very humanoid in shape, but with this German shepherd type face. Um, now, the, 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 you know, for people who, who think this is just nonsense, they just say, you know, it's, it's just nonsense or it's yeah. legend or it's hoaxing and so on. But there are, you know, a substantial number of reports on record to the point where I think Linda has now written like five or six books mm -hmm. on the subject because there's the sheer number of reports and um now people describe them as i said as looking like a wolf-like animal but one which can run on two limbs and and four not like a bear you know a bear mm -hmm. mainly runs on four limbs four legs um and, and they will you know, they will walk on yeah, they will walk mm -hmm. on two, but it's right. difficult for them. It's not something they do regularly, you know, or, or if they want to run, you know, they're not going to run at high speed on two legs. Mm -hmm. But the, the dog men are described that, that that's exactly what they do. Now, kind of like the whole Bigfoot issue as well, one of the things we find with the dog men is that there seem to be, again, some sort uh, kind of supernatural uh, parallels and overtones where, for example, people have seen the um, the dogmen very often at sort of sacred sites like burial grounds, cemeteries, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the mysterious mounds that you can find in, in Wisconsin as well, which we don't still really understand who built them or, or mm -hmm. why. Um, but, you know, when you've got these creatures being seen in specific sort of sacred sites and things like that, um, then you sort of have to wonder, you know, is this a supernatural component? Um, there have been some cases where they've sort of vanished, literally vanished, you know, in front of the person as if they've sort of jumped into a different portal or a, a doorway, that kind of thing that, you know, something we don't fully understand. So I think a lot of these creatures within the field of cryptozoology which have become known as cryptids i think some of them are legitimate unknown animals 
But others, I think they seem to have this sort of paranormal aspect to them. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's some of these creatures are flesh and blood. Others, we don't know what they are. But I think, mm -hmm. I think we need to sort of differentiate between, you know... The, the flesh and blood one and the one and the weird one and uh and sort of as you can imagine a lot of people in cryptozoology think that things like the dogman should not actually be a part of cryptozoology because you know there there is this supernatural aspect so you know it, mm. it sort of creates an interesting debate as to yeah. what what is cryptozoology and what should it be you know oh, that is yes. interesting yeah, and I, I, I can relate to Dogman. So you're speaking to a native Wisconsinite, and I am from Hodag country, okay? Way up north with all the lakes. <laughs> and you are very right. Um, when it comes to the Dogmen, there were a few of them. Like um, when I was growing up, Beast of Bray Road, which is in southern Wisconsin, though that's more of your physical uh, dogmen, but where I lived, a lot of it was linked to Ojibwa, Chippewa, Winnebago uh, tribal culture. And it is true, generally speaking, with the mounds or with the sacred sites in northern Wisconsin for these tribes, they would have protectors, and they were always described as a wolf-like creature. So the question I would ask for uh, of you, Nick, is then with these dogmen, um, and I, I'm going to go back to some of your In Search of Monsters um, episodes. There's a lot of talk about, say, there's a tribal protector, and they yeah. were sacrificed to protect. But, you know, when it comes to supernatural, do you, I mean, curses, is it genetic? It's, it's probably related to the tribal people. Do you have any more insight there? Because so much of it is tied to folklore and legends with the tribes. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point, because, I mean, you can find um, reports and sightings of strange creatures um, in the direct uh, vicinity of, like, sacred sites, stone circles, things like that, all around the world. For example, in, in Stonehenge in England, where I'm originally from, there have been some reports of um, strange creatures seen near um, Stonehenge. They're called the Rollright Stones. Okay. And, um, there have been sightings there as well. Now, one of the interesting theories is that possibly ancient man, you know, the, the, had sort of far more psychic um, mind, if you like, than we do today. And one of the theories is that potentially, let's just sort of take the view that they could sort of conjure up, if you like, from the mind and sort of kick it outward, uh, like the image of a what you call like a supernatural guard dog, you know, not mm -hmm. a real creature, but almost like a projected image from the mind. And this this is the phenomenon, what's known as tulpas or thought forms. Okay. The idea that, yeah, the idea that, um, you know, the human mind, if you focus on something, you can sort of externalize it and project it outwards, and it becomes like its own um, independent entity. And so that's the... So it's a concept, I um, mean, in, um, it began in Tibet uh, with mm. Buddhist teachings. The, the idea that the human mind, if you think about something and focus on it long enough, you can almost, in a strange way, create it, and then it becomes free of the creator. So one of the theories is that things like the dog man and the creatures seen around the Rollwright Stones in the UK and, and Stonehenge, the idea that they are not real creatures... And they may not even be self-aware, but they're sort of like, um, you know, like a loop, you know, like, mm -hmm. like an old video, you know, VHS loop, you know, just playing <laughs> over and over again yeah. to keep people away from sacred sites. And you think you've seen a real creature, but you're seeing this image created perhaps centuries ago, which, as I said, may not even be aware itself of what it is in a strange mm -hmm. way. You know, it, it just roams around in this sort of um you know bizarre kind of half real situation if you like mm -hmm. now, that kind of the tulpa leads into a kind of a slender man discussion um and, and i know you wrote a, an entire book on that what did you find that might be fact and what might be fiction well yeah i mean the slender man uh, phenomenon is, is a fascinating one but it's sort of a 
very kind of disturbing one as Definitely. well. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. it began um, back in 2009, and that's when the Slender Man, by, by that name, was created. And basically, it came down to, um, like, who could... Uh, it's almost like a competition where, you know, let's see who could come up with the creepiest creature on the internet <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. you know, different the different people sort of you know um submitted artwork and pictures and little stories but out of all of them the the one that really captured everybody's attention was this one um that became known as the slender man and it was created by a man who used the alias of victor surge and the, the he created some images. It wasn't like hoaxing. I should stress that he wasn't. There's no hoaxing. It genuinely was like, um, you know, just let's just see who could come up with it with the creepiest, you know, sort of weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the the Slender Man imagery uh, that was created was of this sort of tall, skinny, um, skeletal type figure in a black suit. Uh, white tie, black shirt, excuse me, black tie, white shirt, and, and a completely faceless face. There was like no nose, no eyes, no ears, no, no mouth. So it looked very creepy, and it was, in the stories, it would um, sort of lurk in the woods. Now, that was how, that was the way the story developed, and people um, started making their own um, little shows about the Slender Man on YouTube, and uh, people wrote their own s stories, you know, in Kindle and, um, and mm -hmm. sell them on Amazon and so on. Now, it stayed like that for about five, six, seven months, and then after that, something else uh, happened, which was, like, really weird. People started to claim that they'd seen the Slender Man in the real world. Now, we're not talking about... Um, something that resembled the Slender Man. It was basically, um, you know, the identical image of the Victor Surge creation back in 2009. Mm -hmm. Now, what we know for sure is, you know, that the, at the time when the, when the phenomenon was really at its height, you had literally thousands and thousands and thousands of predominantly kids, teenagers, really buying into all this and talking about it and being fascinated by it, writing their own stories and so on. And so the theory is that with endless, you know, thousands of people um, focusing on the image of the Slender Man can potentially, like with a tulpa or a thought form, project outward from the uh, the human imagination this image of the Slender Man and as the belief in the Slender Man gets stronger and stronger, the ability of this created version of the Slender Man becomes stronger and stronger as well, to the point where the all of the kids who have been focusing on it, thousands and thousands, what happens in the, the uh, Tulpa theory is that eventually the creation breaks free from the creators, in this case would be the kids. And so... Then, so that's basically the theory behind why people are seeing the Slender Man, because it's like, you know, be careful of what you think about, because mm -hmm. you might just create it. And if there's hundreds of, you know, hundreds of thousands of you doing it, then, you know, you, the, you, there's still the original Slender Man, the fictional one, but then you have this sort of spin-off um, born out of the fact that so many people either believe in it or want to believe in it, and then it's essentially, you know, one day it crosses over from being something in the imagination to something in reality. And uh, and we saw sort of the, the most glaring and sort of worst aspect of the whole story in, in 2014, mm -hmm. uh, where two young girls in um, Waukesha, Wisconsin, um, attempted to basically kill and sacrifice one of their former friends uh, in the name of the Slender Man. And, um, you know, this story was um, w was big news all around the world. And the two girls, um, you know, they're now, um, you know, in a government facility and won't be out for decades. And fortunately, the girl who was attacked, um, you know, she made a good recovery both psycho psychologically and physically as well. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it demonstrates that um, how 
something created just as a bit of fun can radically and quite quickly really turn into you know your worst nightmare yeah so in in with that it's like urban legends given a, a physical form so nick with your research and with current trends we have we have a lot of fan fiction we have a lot of forums we have a lot of creepy pastas yeah what did you see another slender man or another thought form like this tulpa we were talking about coming to the fore in the near future um well that's a good question i mean the, the one thing i would say really about the slender man is that very quickly it became like a, this really worldwide phenomenon you know where everybody had heard of the slender man everybody you know in quite quick time knew what it looked like um and really there's not been anything um it's certainly in the internet era that i think has taken off to that extent so right now at least in answer to your question i don't see anything that's you know really kind of taken on that um that kind of fascination and obsession for a lot of people but it could happen and the re again and the reason why it could happen again is because you know with the slender man it was never planned it was mm. basically um it, it literally did come out of nowhere and then just took off massively so there's no reason why so a similar thing couldn't happen you know it could easily happen because it's you know it, it's happened before and um you know there are times when things do just become you know sort of overnight sensations i mean mm -hmm. You go back to when I was a kid, like Rubik cubes. You know, how everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I mean, well, I actually did. not couldn't figure the things out at all. But, <laughs> but, it took um, me a while. but you know, like, yeah. But I mean, like, you know, Rubik cubes, or you know, just just things that sort of come out of nowhere. You know, you, you've got to have this and you've got to have that, you know, kind of like when, um, like when iPods came out, you know, that kind of thing. Everybody had an iPod, you know, now you just use yeah. your phone. But, um, but you know, it, it's, I mean, that's a very different situation, but it does show how something that is sort of perceived as, oh, you know, have you seen this? You've got to look into it. Uh, I think, you know, again, that that could happen, you know. Hopefully, it wouldn't be like with a negative, um, dangerous aspect to it. But then again, you know, I think that was part of the allure of the Slender Man phenomenon was that, you know, the way our brains are wired, we we like scary stories. You mm -hmm. know, that's why horror movies are so <laughs> are so much fun. You know, why yeah. shows like The Walking Dead are like, you know, massive ratings because, you know, we watch things like that because it's like we know it's not real, you know. So mm -hmm. you, you go to the cinema and you watch a, you know, a creepy movie or whatever and, you know, one of the characters gets his head sliced off and what you do, you yeah. sort of jump <laughs> and the, you jump and then you laugh, you know, because right, it's yeah. just, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's, but that's it. That is how, um, uh, you know, we like to be scared, you know, in a in a situation where we know it's not real. And I think yeah. I think what happened was that the lines got blurred with the Slender Man where people who first got into it liked the um like the, the horror creepy side of it, but then they started to cross the line where it became a reality to them, you know, and then that's that's like a totally different, dangerous area. Then, so. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible? And um, I, I know you've studied ley lines somewhat, but I'm thinking that it's almost like the internet is taking power from them somehow and creating these. I, I we'll go ahead and say tulpa type of uh, creations. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, there has been sort of thought in the last few years as to, you know, is the Internet sort of becoming self-aware, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and and it, and it is an interesting question. There have been some weird stories, um, you know, where my Slender Man book, uh, it's called Slender Man Mysteries, um, I, one of the people who I interviewed for the book was a woman who got a real sort of deep obsession, uh, you know, bordering on a... Um, on a dangerous obsession 
into the the whole slender man phenomenon and she told me and she came across as a, you know to a regular normal person but who'd had a a very weird experience or actually several experiences and she told me how on three occasions at the height of her research into the slender man she did admit that she did get obsessed by it and eventually she walked away from it completely but she said on three occasions she saw like the image of the slender man on her laptop one was like a close-up of its face like its faceless face and one was like this skinny figure in black and it just briefly flickered on the screen mm. and it freaked her out because you know she was spending a lot of time investigating she came to believe that somehow um focusing on this image of the slender man and searching all over the internet which she was doing she was printing like pictures from the internet like from google images of the slender man she was taking part in chat rooms and all sorts of different things and then suddenly she started to see the slender man randomly pop up on her screen mm. and she she literally came to believe that somehow the internet itself had an understanding of what she was doing and what she was obsessed with and gave her what she wanted which is like really kind of creepy and weird you know the idea that you're searching mm -hmm. for something on the net and then it it gives it to you you know mm -hmm. but that could also tie into you know if they had alexis sitting right there too and she was talking to herself a bit right <laughs> well yeah well that's true well i, well, I wouldn't i wouldn't um I wouldn't trust anything with uh, Alexis, really. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Artificial intelligence and those algorithms, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is. if you think about it, you know, the, I mean, like Alexis, I mean, the, Alexa, we, we know. I, I mean, so. it, the technology, it's like a lot of technologies. Used the right way, it's a very good thing, mm -hmm. you know. But having something in your house, which government agencies we know can hack into you know it's very easy to um actually hack into alexis and just you know sit in your government office listening into what's going on in somebody's living room you know mm -hmm. 10 20 years ago we would never have thought we'd be having conversations about can today's technology listen to what we're doing in our living room you'd say well that's like George Orwell 1984 mm -hmm. conspiracy stuff. But now today we do have to, you know, consider the possibility that if you have certain social media, you know, certain technologies in your home, then somebody might well be listening. And it may be millions of people who are being listened to. You know, the, the figure is only dictated by how many people buy the technology, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, it's um, it's a strange world right now. In many respects, you know, the internet has changed the world in a very pos positive way. You know, um, but mm -hmm. yeah, but the downside is when it's used in the wrong way. And the way I see that it's being used in the wrong way is for mass surveillance of people who haven't done anything. You know, right, right, yeah, just going way too far with it, obviously. Yeah, I mean, if there's somebody who's, you know, um, posting stuff on social media, you know, and talking about these people, these people need to be killed or whatever, yeah, I get it with that. But, you know, a little old lady who lives in, you know, in a little town in, I don't know, where, you know, Omaha or whatever, you know, she doesn't need to take her shoes off at the airport, you know what I mean? It's like right. all of this stuff has gone way beyond common sense, you know, and, and common sense needs to come back into all this surveillance stuff. The average person sitting in their living room, no one should be listening in because they're watching the, the game or, you know, they're watching American Idol or whatever, you know. <laughs> right. There's no reason... Um, there's no reason why anybody should be listening to anyone under those circumstances. But the, the, the disturbing thing is that so many people put up with it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but one of the things I think is encouraging, you know, over the last few years, there have been a lot of demonstrations about a lot of different issues. People have sort of stood up and said their thing in hundreds of thousands, you know, in, in, um, 
in demonstrations in downtown cities and so on. And um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing to voice, you know, your opinion along with a couple of hundred thousand other people. You know, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That I don't even have, uh, you know, like a smart type car. Um, hmm? Somebody's gonna <laughs> hack me. They're gonna say, "Oh, I'll get that wench. I'll just hack her car <laughs> system and crash her into the bridge." You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I don't. Know, I don't know if you know this. A friend. A friend of mine actually. She's still got like um, a flip phone. You know, one of the uh, <laughs> feature phone, yeah. flip phones. And and it's actually, you know. Um, for the most part, you know, with them, you can speak and you can text, and if that's all you want to do, well, that's great. But mm-hmm. uh, some of those flip phones are actually quite difficult to hack into, and which is kind of an irony, you know. It's yeah. like um, the, the the less the technology, the the harder it is to get in. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, but um, but you know, I mean, the whole issue of surveillance. I mean, everybody's got a phone in their pocket or in their hand, mm-hmm. um, and. You know, I mean, if you think about it, most people perhaps will, um, you know, book their doctor's appointment through the phone. They'll, you know, book a ticket to go on vacation Mm. and so on and so on. So in other words, um, if somebody wanted to basically hack into your phone, they would find just about every aspect of your life, you know, uh, where you bank, who your doctor is, where you're going on vacation, um you know, when you just got your your car repaired or whatever, um, Mm -hmm. you know, the amount of material that can be reaped, if you like, from a phone Mm -hmm. is is incredible, but it's also disturbing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's like when people used to say, you know, we're all going to be implanted, you know, with chips (laughs) and the government can follow us. Well, they don't need to implant us or chip us because we've already got a chip. It's called a a, a smartphone, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, So, so there's good things and bad things, you know. Yeah, so on this subject, let's just talk about what's trending with deep fakes because at the end of the day, most of the electronics that we use are made overseas. We don't know what kind of software. Like there was the, um, I might mispronounce it, the Huawei uh, cell phone technology company from China. Everyone's putting everything on social media. We have powerful artificial intelligence that goes into your home. I know this. I have about a dozen Alexas, Google Nest stuff in my house. I mean, I can be (laughs) recreated digitally very easily, Nick. So with deep fakes, who is who would be the target besides politicians? Okay, but you know they become good memes. But like, how much of our lives can just be replicated? Can we potentially become victims of like fraud where someone commits a crime? Like, let's just take bank fraud for example. That's rife. And using these deep this deep fake technology that we've surrendered. What what is going on there? Well, yeah, I think, you know, that, that, that's an important issue because we've, in one sense, you know, as I said, the technology is good if it's used correctly, but we've become sort of a, we've become slaves to the technology. Um, you know, we've become slave to, you know, just assuming that what we're using is, you know, is not a threat to us, you know, mm-hmm. or it's not going to be, in, you know, in, intrusion. But I think... You know, the more the technology develops, it's almost like you're forced to have more of the technology. You know, I mm-hmm. mean, um, I mean, most people probably, um, well, most people probably couldn't get away without a smartphone. You know, I couldn't. No. But that's, that's only because everybody else, you know, it's like, for example, um, I mean, let's say, for example, with your um I don't know, you're going on vacation or something mm-hmm. like that, and you're forced to use the technology because perhaps the company that you're using requires you to book it the book the um, the ticket online, mm-hmm. you know. The days of going into the local shop, or, you know, and booking your ticket <laughs> are, are long gone, you know. We don't deal uh, but, with people anymore, no. <laughs> yeah. But um, so in other words, you know, to allow you to go on vacation, you're forced to go onto the net to book the ticket. Do you see what I mean? And, and I don't—I I should stress—I don't have any problem with this. I enjoy, you know, the the, 
the fact, uh, you know, the technology, because it makes it so much easier. But in saying that, because you're forced to use that technology, you have to wonder, you know, are there back doors in these technologies? You know, um, is it allowing you to be watched even more and so on? You know, and um, so I think in that sense, you know, the technology is great, but, um, you know, how do we deal with, with situations when, you know, you you know, you're sort of entering your name here, your address here, your social security number there, and, you know, where is it all going? You know, is there sort of like a, you know, like a black box kind of thing that's, um, you know, with um, back doors, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, the algorithms can stitch it all together. Yeah. Jacob works for Microsoft, so he knows. Oh, was I might know a little that? something about that. Uh, you know, they might they might complain, but yeah, I'm one of the big bads. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that. There's um, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Please use the search engine Bing. Okay, that's my go. that's my pitch. Okay. <laughs> Um, Well, Nick, uh, you've traveled all over the world in search of many different cryptids. Do you have favorite places to visit and favorite cryptids to investigate and and hunt down? Yeah, um, I I suppose the expeditions that I've enjoyed most of all have been when I've uh, been to Puerto Rico looking for the original Chupacabra. You know, Mm -hmm. people think of the Chupacabra Mm -hmm. today, they think of like these hairless dog-like animals that mainly been seen in Texas and some of the surrounding states. But the original chupacabra phenomenon kicked off in 1995 in Puerto Rico, where people described um, this sort of a, a creature with a body kind of at the size and uh, of, of like a chimpanzee, but completely hairless and had these sort of glowing red eyes. And he had like a, a row of spikes down his head and neck, kind of like a punk rock mohawk kind of uh, um, imagery and um and it reportedly uh, attacked and killed farm animals and there were rumors of it even supposedly draining blood from the animals and uh, and i've been on a lot of expeditions to puerto rico um looking for the chupacabra spoke to a lot of people over the years i think i've been there probably seven eight nine times now over the course of about nearly 20 years and um and got a lot of really interesting stories from police officers, uh, ranchers, you know, regular people, uh, and so on. And um, and, I, and I like Puerto Rico. You know, it's a cool place as well. And um, it is. I you know, it's sort, of, it's sort of like yeah, it's kind of like vacationing and doing a monster hunt at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you sort of chase for the. Uh, Chupacabra in the morning, and then in the yeah. evening, you know, it's time for a couple of margaritas or whatever. So, uh, <laughs> right, hit the Bacardi and, uh, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then go look for giant oh, snapping well. turtles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there is a real Chupacabra phenomenon from all the people I've spoken to. Um, what it is, I don't know. Again, the number of cases kind of like with Bigfoot and the Dogman, where people have seen UFOs in the same time and proximity. Um, as as the chupacabra, you know, and UFO seen together, and um, and also some s- cases which seem more supernatural, where they've kind of again vanished in like a flash of light and so on. And um, so for me, the you know the um, the chupacabra expeditions I've done for me have been the most enjoyable and you know interesting. And uh, and I put all that together in a book a couple of years ago called Chupacabra road trip which is which is basically a study of all the expeditions i've been on looking for the chupacabra and uh, it's sort of written in like a like a diary format you know kind of like um it was a dark and stormy night and i jumped in the car and <laughs> headed off into the jungle you know it's kind of written so you follow the story you know as it went along so to speak mm-hmm. So, uh, Nick, in that regard, I, I have, like, two questions. It is the 15th anniversary of uh, Three Men Seeking Monsters. And since we were on the subject of your travels, do you have another traveling monster book? I mean, it, I checked it out. The Chupacabra book uh, was published November 2018. But I, I really like your adventure books like that. Do you have anything else like that in the works? 
Well, I do. Um, for the most part, if I'm get, when I'm doing the Chupacabra book, excuse me, the cryptozoology books, for the most mm -hmm. part, uh, apart from the, the Bigfoot book that I did and another one called The Monster Book, where the publisher had a particular style where they have to be sort of written in, like, all it's different entries, A to Z. Gotcha. You know, so, mm -hmm. and it's, it's sort of you're written, you write it, but you're sort of detached from the stories, you know. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm actually um, working on um, another book right now, which is, is sort of, be kind of like a road trip. It won't be, it's not a cryptid book, but it's about all my investigations into the real Men in Black report okay. and stories. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a road trip, but... Um, investigating and you know tracking down witnesses in relation to men in black cases but um but yeah i mean something you know big comes along um yeah it'd be sort of cool to do another sort of um you know crypto road trip because i think people kind of like that you know they become part of the story rather than being detached you know you and you kind of get that sense of, of being there at the same time as well so it's always good now um You've mentioned Men in Black, and I was curious. Um, I know you've written many books and Women in Black as well. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think there's any correlation between the uh, people in black and shadow figures, shadow people that people see all the time? Yeah. Yeah, I actually do. I've done uh, four books on the Men in Black and one on Women in Black, and um, and there's no doubt that there's certain phenomena which all seem to be somehow connected that's like the men in black the women in black mm -hmm. the shadow people and there's like a category within the shadow pe uh, people known as the hat man which is like this shadowy figure wearing like an old style 1950s fedora hat which is how some of the men in black used to dress as well and i think it also ties in with the phenomenon of the black-eyed children and one of the things that all these creatures if you like have in common is that they all try and find ways to get into the home for reasons you know we don't always understand but one of the theories is they kind of sort of bleed us dry of energy you know, almost in like a parasitic fashion you know that um that they they quite literally in a strange way sort of um are feeding on us but it's left it's sort of like feeding on you know, our, our energy, our psychic energies, if you like, um, rather than, you know, physically feeding on us. And there are a lot of cases like that where people have been in the presence of, like, the men in black, um, the shadow people, and they've suddenly started to feel weak and shaky. Um, you know, like one, one person described it like, like, a, like a diabetic, you know, if they miss breakfast and lunch and then dinner comes around and before they can get it, they start getting the shakes and they get mm -hmm. cold and, you know, and hot, uh, they don't feel once, well. And, yep. I've been yeah, diabetic since that, I was two, so I understand. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and people have, ex have said that's how they felt, you know, that's as if Ew. these creatures were, were draining them of, their, of their life force. Now, mm -hmm. you know, when people think of the men in black... They think of, like, you know, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones, you know. I do, guilty. Good, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the movies are good fun, but what people don't, many people don't know is that the real men in black, or the movies are inspired by real reports, but the real reports are actually nothing like the movies. In the movies, you know, they work for the, this secret government agency, mm -hmm. but 99% of... Um, all the cases on record or thereabouts, um, people describe the men in black as looking very skinny and pale, and they have these large eyes that they hide behind wraparound sunglasses, and they wear their black suits. But they don't, you know, if you look close to them, they don't look not entirely human. Their skin looks sort of plastic, and people have mm. said they, they weren't able to tell how old the person was. It was like or the man in black was it was almost like they were ageless you know you couldn't tell you know were they like a i don't know a young 50 or you know or, or vice versa and mm -hmm. so you know the the real reports are far more sort of a supernatural and occult based than ufo based but um but yeah for this reason you know i think because the the aspects are all so similar i think whether it's the black eyed children 
men in black, women in black, shadow people, hat man. I think they're all somehow connected and there seems to be a connection with this sort of um, like parasitic aspect to it as well. Very cool. Now, um, would there be a place, say, in Australia, Eer- Eerie's Rock, is that correct? Where UFOs are very common. Have you been there? Uh, have you Not- seen it? I've never actually been to Australia at all. I'd like to go, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've never had the chance, but, I mean, Australia does have a lot of UFO activity, and um, back in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of UFO reports at a place called Pine Gap in Australia, and Pine Mm. Gap, the Australian version of uh, the National Security Agency over here, uh, in other words, it's like an eavesdropping um, surveillance type organisation. And over the years, there have been a lot of activity of, of strange objects flying around Pine Gap. Um, you know, so that's an interesting aspect. And, and there's another reason why I'd like to go to Australia one day. Uh, you know, a lot of people think Australia is just large, you know, just desert. But it's actually not. It has a massive amount, I mean, literally massive amount of forest land, I mean, gigantic forests. And um, over the years, people have reported seeing very large lizards, sort of 10 to 15, maybe even 20 feet long. And one of the theories is that these are surviving pockets of a very ancient monitor lizard called Megalania, which Mm -hmm. lived up to about 10,000 years ago. And Megalania was like this huge, vicious... um, uh, lizard. If you look at a photograph of um, a Komodo dragon, which is a very dangerous um, large um, lizard, um, and then you double it or triple it in size at 20 feet, you know, it'd be kind of very cool to sort of go for looking for Megalania and to see if they actually still exist, you know. So Hello? then... Oh, no, still here. Still here. Sorry. It's Nick. I was a really big fan of your book, uh, The World's Weirdest Places. Oh, yeah. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that one came out in 2014 or 2015. Are you going to do another book that's kind of Atlas-based? Because I, one of the big things is we talked about ley lines and where UFO activity, cryptids might be common. It would be really great to see some kind of map type uh, book for yeah. that. Do you have anything for that? Uh, I don't right now, but the book, uh, World's Weird- uh, Weirdest Places, it was basically like about 20 chapters on different places around the world, which have like numerous weird things going on, you know, like, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one area of forest where people are seeing Bigfoot, UFOs, werewolves, you know, ghosts. Mm-hmm. So in other words, like hot spots, like the Bermuda Triangle and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But that book... Um, you know, sort of covered about um, 20 places. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I I would do another one. I think it would have to be somehow kind of like significantly different. You know, you don't want to just sort of um, have something that's like too repetitive, you know. Um, But, I mean, that one was sort of like, um, you know, the weird places. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I might sort of think of the idea of, you know, just the weird things that are in the places as well, you know, um, you know, specific places where you might see Bigfoot, that kind of thing, you know, or yeah. or lake monsters, like a study mm-hmm. of lake. I'm actually doing a, a study of lake monsters and sea serpents, which I think that book will be out early next year. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of lake monsters. Growing up in northern Wisconsin, we had mm-hmm. Peppy... Uh, yeah. you know, we got stuff in all the Great Lakes and and the different uh, rivers in Wisconsin. But the next question I have for you, because we didn't really touch on this, is with the show In Search of Monsters, which just wrapped its first season. And Jacob yeah. uh, is enamored of. I watch all the shows. You have no idea, Nick. <laughs> if it's a monster or a ghost show, I'm on it. So uh, the question that I have for you is um, – While you were filming that one, you you being the cryptozoologist, Lynn S. McNeil from Utah State University was quite involved uh, as a folklorist. And I was wondering, did you get to collaborate or did you see or were there any kind of conflicts between what cryptozoologists had researched versus what she found through her study of folklore? Um, There was no sort of conflict in terms of 
debate because the way it was filmed, um, you know, when you when you did most uh, most TV shows do this, they basically you're on your own when you're filmed. Oh, you, know, okay. you don't actually you don't get to meet the other people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like um, they fly you out to wherever the filming's going to be, and they might you know they interview me on Monday, Monday morning gotcha. say. Yeah. And then they take, then they'll take me back to the airport for the flight back, and then they'll film somebody else in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So, although you know everybody was sort of regulars on the show, the big irony is, you know, none of us really got to hang out with each other at all, and you know, talk about the different things. But I think, you know, I, I think it's important to address things like you know the folkloric mythology side of all this as well because you know there's no doubt that in my mind that there is a bigfoot phenomenon that's just one mm -hmm. example but you can also make a case that you know bigfoot has also become part of folklore folklore in in the same way that um everybody's heard of it everybody knows what it looks like mm -hmm. and so on and so it's be it has become a part of folklore and i think you know at times the lines are blurred between what we know for sure about Bigfoot, you know, the science behind it and um, footprints and, you know, photographs and film. But then there's also, you know, the folkloric thing, you know, the sort of, the, you know, sitting around the campfire, mm -hmm. uh, you know, late at night, that sort of thing. So, so I think, you know, both sides are relevant and important because, you know, Bigfoot isn't as just one example, but you can apply this to many different things. Bigfoot is something that fascinates people, but mm -hmm. also a lot of people also, you know, just find the stories creepy and fun, you yeah. know. So I think, yeah. you know, it's important because it, it demonstrates how the human mind sort of looks at it in different ways, depending on how... Um, you, you know, it's presented, if you like. Mm -hmm. And for, during the season, um, just for the fans out there and stuff, personally for you, what was your favorite episode? And if there's a next season, what cryptids do you hope they put on? <laughs> well, I don't know um, what's happening, if there's going to be a second season or not. But um, I, I was actually, fishing there. For one, of them, uh, for one of them, at least, I would, I would say Megalania, the Australian one. But I guess... That depends on the budget, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there'll be that one, um, and I think also, you know, some of the um, lesser-known um, lake monsters in the U.S. I mean, everybody's kind of heard of like Algo Pogo and Champ, and, and you know, they're, they're good cases. But it's like Loch Ness, you know, it's um, it's kind of you know typical, um, you know, inevitable that they're going to get picked, but. Um, but there are some interesting um, ones. For example, um, not too far from me, just over the border into o Oklahoma, um, there's a story what's known as the Oklahoma octopus, which oh. is like this weird tentacled creature that's been seen in a number of lakes uh, in the area. And that's not many people know about that, but it's a really interesting story. So, you know, maybe a couple of re um, kind of obscure but really interesting lake monster stories would be good. And, um, you know, maybe some of the offshoots of, um, you know, things like Bigfoot, like, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in Sumatra, you've got the Orang Pendek, which is this yeah. small upright ani animal that looks looks like a human because it walks upright, but it's, mm -hmm. it's said to be an ape, but some people wonder if it's a primitive human. Now, again, budgets permitting you know a trip to sumatra would be cool you know yeah, to, uh, <laughs> totally <laughs> <laughs> to try and find you know um the the orange pendek and um maybe also you know a sea serpent you don't hear much mm -hmm. too much about sea serpents you know they sort of uh a lot more prevalent you know in the 17th 18th 19th mm -hmm. century but um yeah that well, would, you would be cool yeah, so the one thing that I think is interesting is we have the mysterious whale deaths on the Pacific Coast, so especially up here in the Pacific Northwest, I'm out of Seattle. Uh, we've had 61, I think it's gray whales, wash up from Northern California through uh, Washington State, and we're not really sure what's doing it. So that would be interesting if we got some more research uh, into that some of them aren't in the best shape and you know some of them are standard human uh, conditions with pollution 
Um, but it'd be interesting to see if we get if if there's a sea creature l- lurking out there that might be doing something, or maybe it's the sonar testing, the new weapons testing as it's, well. It's the weapons testing. Yeah. It always is. We need Godzilla <laughs> yeah. to come in and uh, you know. Oh yeah. yeah, I do love a kaiju. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, you've both been to Loch Ness, I believe. Um, and what are yeah. your thoughts on the the area, the locale? Did you go to old uh, Crowley's house or anything? So, Nick, you go. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing I got the first time I went to Loch Ness is the same now. It's like it, it doesn't just come across like a lake. It's actually quite a creepy atmosphere, you know, it, it has sort of, um, you know, like a like a strange vibe to it. You know, you can almost, you're almost looking out there, you know, particularly if it's dark and cold, you know, and the clouds are sort of racing by and you've got these several old castles dotted around mm-hmm. the lock itself, you know, and then you've got the monster legend and Alex mm-hmm. de Crowley's mm-hmm. old house, Boleskine House, which actually got burned down a couple of years ago, or, or badly burned, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But you put all that together, and I think the one thing that you get is that there really is this sort of strange atmospheric vibe to the area. You know, it's almost like somebody said, oh, yeah, you know, if we're going to put a monster somewhere, let's put it in there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, I think for me, that's, it's, all, it's that sort of magical, um, creepy vibe about it that, uh, that I like in you know? Yeah, my experience is when uh, this was probably six years ago, I went and I took the train from Edinburgh and I was going to Portree uh, on the Isle of Skye and we had a stop off um, at Inverness and it, it was gorgeous. We went in the fall, so you had the colors and the train went right around the lock like you could spit out the window and hit it. OK, wow. and of course, we had to had to change. We had to change trains. Mm -hmm. So we get off at the little station there, and of course, there was a gift shop. So, of course, I'm looking for Nessie stuffed animals. (laughs) And I just got a bunch of cockeyed looks like, really? (laughs) And like, just sell me the damn doll. (laughs) But everyone was really nice. But uh, the the residents weren't... um, they they weren't supported uh, supportive of my Loch Ness uh, short monster hunting. All, all sweet folks though, <laughs> and the whiskey is amazing in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think anybody who sort of works in this field, you know, you you kind of get that kind of uh, response from people. You know, people ask me what I do, you say, oh, you know, I investigate. Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and the Chupacabra and sometimes mm-hmm. people are like that's really cool and other times it's like okay <laughs> <laughs> with the eye roll yes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but uh, I don't care yeah I don't care yeah <laughs> I'm the same way I, I mean I'm primarily a ghost hunter on the side and you know I get all the crazy looks <laughs> <laughs> um go ahead so. Jacob sorry. I, I was going to say, um, I do, because we, we're getting to time, mm-hmm. but I did want to say that I believe a colleague of Nick's has a new show coming out tomorrow. Um, it's called Paranormal Pioneers, and it has David Weatherly as one of the co-hosts. Mm-hmm. And it will focus on the pioneers uh, in paranormal research. Um, it debuts tomorrow night. And I just wanted to drop that little bit of info um, sure. and get ready it's to sign right up. here on our Crimson Cloak Network, and uh, so to tune in. Mm-hmm. 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain. We have too many time zones. <laughs> well, we've also got Linda, uh, Linda coming on on July 10th and talk about her book coming out, I Know What I Saw. Which should be a great, another great fun show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But. Definitely, I'm a huge fan. I have just as many books of hers <laughs> and Dogmen. Having grown up mm-hmm. where I did, Dogmen's Dogmen are very close to my heart, mm-hmm. and so I are like monsters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not that kind. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nick, if uh, people want to get a hold of you or follow you, um, how would they do that? 
Um, well, I have a blog, uh, which is called World of Whatever. If you just type in Nick Redfern, okay. World of Whatever, you'll find my mm -hmm. blog, and people can uh, reach me there. Or um, they can reach me at Twitter, Nick Redfern UFO, or just type in uh, Nick Redfern at Facebook. And there's a few of us, but um, you'll see me. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Um, and right. Um, people want to, you know, if people want to chat, or if they want advice or got any questions I'm always happy to help you know i'm not one of these um don't talk to me i'm an author you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I, I can't stand that kind of you know pompous approach or whatever I'm, you know if anybody wants to chat or just hang out you know i'm uh, i'm always around so and let's Wonderful. not forget flying Flying Saucers and The Kremlin came out on June 9th. It's available on Amazon in print as well as Kindle. We've got Cover Ups and Cover Ups and Secrets as well came out on June 1st. That is available in audiobook, print, and Kindle as well. So head out to Amazon, get a copy. They're both great books. But I don't I don't do the audio, that's that's too much. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a pretty thick like, book, I'm, I gotta I'm, say. <laughs> yeah. It's like I mean they get professional um, readers, you know, to do those uh, audio books, and I tried doing just like one page out of one of my books, and it was like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> but is it a you British know, reader? You've got to focus on not getting even one word remotely <laughs> even wrong, and then you've yes. got to do three hundred pages. I'm like, okay, pay the guy who, who exactly. really knows yep. how to do this, you know. <laughs> yeah, but the it's British accent, the British accent can help sell. Let me tell you. <laughs> Well, it's, never, it's actually never been a, a problem with girlfriends. They all, they all, they all love the English accent over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, Nick, thank it you so help. much. Yep. <laughs> thank you very much. Yep, thank you for being on tonight. Yeah, you're always a great guest here um, and always welcome. And I'm going to go well, back and I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to go back and have my fanboy moment. Like, oh, my God, I got to talk to Nick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell all my friends, actually, I'm about to send out the messages. It's like, you have to listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. Young Padawan. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I thought I thought I would be, like, <laughs> breaking up in giggling fits. <laughs> You've done, like I said, exceptionally well. And, thank and, you very yeah. much, Wendy. I have a great mentor. Yes, you do, actually. <laughs> and it's not Ross. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Um, anyway, thanks, Nick. And uh, I guess we'll close out the show and and talk to you all next week when we have uh, Peter James Haviland on. He's a, uh, I guess he's psychic. Uh, he's a hypnotist and he finds, help find, helps find lost children all over the place and i i've seen a lot of his posts he's also a, a dog fanatic and into the rescue very heavily so that's going to be a good show as well anything else jacob uh you know like i said tomorrow night paranormal pioneers with ross allison and david weatherly 10 p.m eastern 7 p.m pacific right here on the crimson cloak radio network yeah. um First guest is Lloyd Auerbach, the paranormal professor himself. So I am very excited about that one. I will <laughs> definitely be tuning in. Yes, you will. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Take care. Thanks, guys. Take care. Tune in tomorrow night to Paranormal Pioneers with Ross Allison and David Weatherly at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. The paranormal professor himself, Lloyd Auerbach, is the guest. That's Paranormal Pioneers with Ross Allison and David Weatherly, Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, only on Crimson Cloak Radio. Turn your radio up, everybody around now.
the V, the V, and that's all, folks.